Castles dot the landscape of the UK that they used to dominate. From the earliest hill forts through King Alfred's burrs, the Conqueror's castles, pleasure palaces, romantic ruins, to tourist attractions. This is the story of the castle in Britain, simplified. The word castle derives from the Latin castrum, which simply means fortified place. That could encompass a whole variety of locations, so the definition is generally narrowed down to require it to be a private residence that is fortified. A castle will usually be a property owned and occupied by an individual rather than being designed to defend a community and tend to be built in stone. Iron Age hill forts often provide locations for later castles and many may have been defensive structures using the landscape to give an elevated position. These were enclosed places but were communal in a way that distinguishes them from castles. King Alfred the Great organised resistance to Viking incursions by creating burrs and road systems. These sometimes used old hill fort locations, but again were designed to be defensible locations a community could retreat into in the event of attack. Whilst it may be arguable, they aren't usually classed as castles. There's some technical jargon that's used to describe the core components that make up most castles. If you want to build a fairly basic castle, these are the parts you'll probably want to include. A mot is a hill on which at least part of the castle will be built. If you can find a suitable one in the landscape nearby, that's perfect, saves a lot of hard work. Though obviously you'd get some peasants to do that for you anyway. Your keep is the heart of your castle. Whether it's built in wood or stone, it would usually sit on top of the mot and represent the most defensible part of the castle, the place you and your family could retreat to and defend, hopefully indefinitely, in the event of an attack. When not under attack, the keep can be used as comfortable lodgings for you or for your guests. The last main requirement is your bailey. This is an enclosed area defended by a wooden palisade or stone walls. A mott and bailey castle then is simply a raised area of ground that is enclosed with space around it. Moats feature in some castles too. These are wide, deep trenches surrounding all or an inner part of the castle as yet another obstacle to attackers. If you've had to build your mott and you've planned it properly, you could create a moat at the same time from the excavations. Moats could be dry or they could be filled with water. Now you can add bells and whistles, curtain walls, an impressive gatehouse or a great hall if you'd like and if the locals give you time. But with these parts in place, you have the good basis of a strong, defensible castle. It's hard to be certain about where and when the first structure we could call a castle was built. The citadel of Aleppo in northern Syria is one candidate for the oldest. It's thought that a fortified palace had been on that site since around 3000 BCE, and it's been occupied by Greeks, Byzantines, Ottomans and others over the millennia of its existence. In England, the arrival of castles is most closely associated with the Norman conquest in 1066. Until then, castles were becoming increasingly popular on the continent, but weren't used in England. There's evidence of castles emerging in Europe in the 9th and 10th centuries, perhaps as a result of the collapse of the Carolingian Empire and less centralised security. There may have been a few stray castles in England before the conquest. One example is Richard's Castle on the border between Shropshire and Herefordshire. Edward the Confessor granted land here to a Norman knight named Richard Scrob, who had built a Mott and Bailey castle on the site 
by 1051. Castles in England before the conquest weren't unheard of, but they were very rare. Richard's Castle is therefore a candidate for the first castle built in England, though only the earthworks remain to be seen today. Early in the 11th century, there had been a growth in the construction of castles in Europe. The lack of castles in England perhaps reflects its geographical disconnect from the continent, but we can't be certain why the trend failed to make its way across the Channel in any significant way. When William the Conqueror invaded in 1066, he brought the castle with him as a method of imposing the rule of the minority on the Anglo-Saxon majority. To some extent, he literally brought it with him. He had three flat pack castles on the ships that brought him across the Channel, the first of which was thrown up to help them defend their landing point at Pevensey Bay. As the Norman Conquest gripped England, castles were critical to allowing small numbers of Norman barons and knights to control great swathes of Anglo-Saxon England. Castles were usually built initially in wood so that they could be put up quickly. Over the decades that followed, they were slowly replaced with stone structures, particularly where there was ongoing conquest, such as along the Welsh borderlands, known as the Marches. The introduction of the castle to England brought with it a whole new form of conflict, castle warfare. There were some fairly well-established and usually well-respected rules to castle warfare during the medieval period. Pitched battles were seen as risky, unpredictable gambles that should be avoided. When a castle was attacked, the garrison within could choose to surrender immediately or they could defend the castle if they think they have the supplies or that help might come. The attackers would then set in for a siege, trying to cut off supplies of food or reinforcements. Those inside would hope the castle was stocked with enough food and a well that wouldn't run dry. They might also deploy siege weapons if they had any. The most common of these was a trebuchet, which could hurl stones at the castle to knock holes in walls and demoralize the garrison. The later arrival of gunpowder weapons meant that cannon could do this even more effectively. Defenders had plenty of options at their disposal too. Arrow slits in the walls offered good cover for archers firing down on the enemy. Boiling oil is often associated with castle defence, but in reality it was very rarely used. It was expensive and hard to boil, though it would at least make it slippery underfoot for the attackers. Throwing things down was definitely a tactic though. We can see murder holes, often in gatehouses, that would allow defenders to bombard those breaching the castle. Hot sand was used, which would be a nightmare to get inside your armour, and boiling water was far more common than boiling oil. But throwing down rocks and stones could be effective enough too. There was also a mechanism to try and bring about an end to a siege. A garrison would be allowed to appeal to their master for aid. A date would be set by which help should arrive. If it did, then there might be a battle outside the walls, or the besieging force might try to withdraw if it didn't fancy the fight. If no help came by the set date, the garrison should surrender the castle and the besieging force should allow them to leave unharmed. If the fixed date for help to arrive passed by and the help didn't come, but the garrison decided not to surrender, then the siege would be played out, but the garrison could expect to be executed if the castle fell. Everyone knew the rules and the risks they took. During the anarchy, the civil war between 1139 and 1153, when King Stephen and Empress Matilda fought for the crown, castle warfare dominated the conflict. Castles were besieged, counter castles were built to oppose the domination of castles or as bases to lay siege to them. One of the tasks for Henry II after the anarchy was to organise the destruction of dozens and dozens of new, unlicensed castles. Many of the early castles in England 
were built in existing towns. Others grew up in rural settings that were strategically important. Although castles always had a military function, they were also designed to be the comfortable, lavish homes for the nobility that projected their power and wealth. There are myths about the military nature of castles that are being steadily dispelled. It was once thought that spiral staircases always turned clockwise to favour a right-handed defender higher up the steps over a right-handed attacker trying to press upwards. It's now thought that this was never the case and that almost as many staircases turn anti-clockwise as turn clockwise. It's possible that the military aspects of castles have been overplayed. An established castle will usually have a great hall where the Lord would entertain his guests and those in his service. This was all about display. If you're rich and powerful, you aren't going to want to live in a rough, uncomfortable, cold stone fortress. Castles developed for comfort as much as for defence. Castles became less important, at least militarily, as the medieval period moved into the early modern. They were central to episodes of the Wars of the Roses, and although Henry VIII built coastal fortifications, they'd largely settled into life as increasingly comfortable palatial residences. The English Civil War in the middle of the 17th century saw castles pressed back into the kind of service they hadn't seen for 200 years. When tensions between King Charles I and Parliament spilled over into warfare between 1642 and 1651, castles were garrisoned by both sides and were the scenes of some bitter sieges. At Goodrich Castle in Herefordshire, a royalist garrison tried to hold out against a parliamentarian siege. Colonel John Birch, who was leading the parliamentarian forces, tried to undermine the castle or assault it, but found the medieval structure too hard to breach. He ordered the construction of a huge mortar in June 1646. There was still a fondness for nicknaming weapons and Birch dubbed this one Roaring Meg. I can't help wondering whether he knew a Meg who was a bit noisy. Roaring Meg was capable of firing 200 pound or 85 kilogram grenades. These were hollowed shells filled with gunpowder. The fuse was lit as it was fired and the idea was that they would explode as soon as possible after impact. A medieval castle wasn't built to withstand this kind of weapon. Birch focused on the Lady Tower in the northwest and brought it down, making the defence of the castle impossible. It was surrendered to Birch on the 31st of July, 1646, and Parliament ordered it slighted, made indefensible so it could never be used against them again. The outcome of this is the Goodrich Castle that we're able to visit today. Slighting was the fate of many castles during and after the Civil War. Parliamentary forces tore down walls, blew up towers and stripped lead from roofs, creating many of the ruins that we see today. This was to be the last stand of the castle in England, a relic of the past that had tried to withstand the destructive power of a future it was never built for. In the years that followed the Civil War, castles fell out of use. Those that hadn't been slighted and left as ruins became expensive and unfashionable. They were mostly abandoned and left to the elements. Georgians in the 18th century and the Victorians in the 19th were attracted to these romantic ruins as a seemingly distant past. Many were overgrown with ivy, crumbling where they'd been deprived of their roof. They made a nice place to wander around and connect with the country's lost heritage, a bygone era that probably looked better in the way the past always tends to. World War I saw German bombings of Scarborough Castle and other locations. Some fortresses were pressed back into active military service. Tynemouth Castle, Pendennis Castle, 
and Landguard Fort are just a few examples. They were never used in the end because the Royal Navy gained dominance in the Channel. But castles leapt back into action again during World War II, when a German invasion on the south coast seemed a genuine probability. Some coastal castles were ideally located to protect against air and sea assaults. Hurst Castle near Bournemouth and Pendennis Castle in Cornwall housed gun batteries. At Pevensey Castle near Eastbourne, the site of the Conqueror's Flatpack Castle in 1066 was still strategically vital. Identified as a potential landing spot, the castle's perimeters were reinforced and an observation post was set up within. The castle's towers became barracks for a garrison that included Home Guard, Canadian and US forces. Machine gun pillboxes and anti-tank weapons were installed at the west gate, the new stonework made to look ancient to help camouflage the weapons. Even the Cold War saw castles used for their location and robust construction. Tunnels under Dover Castle housed government rooms. Almost a thousand years after their arrival in England, these slumbering giants rallied to meet a nation's need. The buildings still didn't rest. Today, castles, many of them ruins that offer us a fading echo of previous greatness, are still found sprinkled liberally around the United Kingdom. Some are even still in use. Windsor Castle is the oldest castle still providing accommodation to its owner today. It has been used by monarchs since Henry I at the beginning of the 12th century and is still a home today at the beginning of the 21st. Castles in the UK today range from barely more than a motte, a hill on which there was once a castle, through blasted ruins to hotels and homes to nobility and royalty. They were never really about one thing and continue to perform a variety of functions to this day. For most of us, they're tourist attractions managed by English heritage or in private hands, but open to the public. Some of my favorite days out are to castles I find it spine-tingling to stand in places where some of the people I study from centuries ago stood and thought about what was going on in their lives. It's incredible, too, that for some of these buildings, their military past isn't as distant as we might think. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.